Hi friends, this is Riddhi Joshi and today I am going to talk about shoulder joint differential diagnosis. So in order to see about the shoulder differential diagnosis, first of all we need to know about the shoulder examination. Let's see. In shoulder examination, we are going to see that about the age, at which age, which pathology is common. So in 20 to 40 years, calcific deposits is very common. In late teens or late 20s, the secondary impingement due to shoulder instability is very common. If the patient or if the children is doing overhead activities, for an example swimming or baseball pitchers, so they have in 20s. If the patient is on 30 years, so chondrosarcomas are common in some patient. In 40 to 50 years, rotator cuff degeneration, tear, they are common. If the age is greater than 35 years, primary impeachment due to degeneration and weakness. Up to 45 to 60 years, frozen shoulder is very common. Now we are going to see about the pathology and chief complaint of that specific pathology. Let's see. In rotator cuff tear, what is the complaint of the patient in their own word? They have difficulty in the elevation of arm in abduction as well as external rotation when patient is attempt to put their hand behind their head or back. If the patient is having posterior capsular contracture, so they have symmetric loss of active and passive internal range of motion. Especially patient who reports difficulty in tucking their shirts have a limited internal rotation from posterior capsular stiffness. So if posterior capsular stiffness patient is telling that I am not able to tuck my shirt. So remember they have posterior capsular contracture. If the patient is having acromioclavicular joint pain, so what they will complain? They will say that in arm motion above 90 degree of abduction with horizontal adduction they have pain that means if they are going above 90 degree abduction or horizontally abducting so they feel pain especially the periarticular mechanical problems patients say that the pain is very worse at night but it is increased when rolling on their especially affected side shoulder Let's see the sternoclavicular joint pain. So that patient will complain that the pain is localized to that specific joint means sternoclavicular joint and it is increased in horizontal adduction. In the patient with anterior instability, patient will complain that pain ha they have pain during late cocking phase and the acceleration phase of pitching the baseball. In thoracic outlet syndrome, they have deep, boring or toothache-like pain in their neck, shoulder or both the area like neck and shoulder. So these all are pathologies and the chief complaints of the patient. Let's see the pain type and what it indicates. See if the patient is having radiating pain or a radicular pain. So it, the characteristic is sharp, burning and radiating. So it will be sharp and burning pain and it will radiate to your arm, forearm or wrist. If the patient is having bony pain, so it's boring and localized to specific joint and it is deep aching. If the patient is having muscular pain, so they are having aching pain, dull and hard to localize. <laughs> If the patient is having tendon pain, tendinitis pain, so it hot and burning pain. Especially the vascular pain is there, so it's like diffused, poorly localized and it may refer to other area of your body. Hi friends, let's see about the pain relieving factors in specific pathologies. So if the patient is having cervicogenic cause, so what is the factor which relieves your pain if the patient is elevating their arm overhead so it will relieve their pain 
if the patient is having acromioclavicular separation or rotator cuff tear so it will relieve with elbow supported like this if the patient is having subluxation pain is relieved by circumduction of the shoulder they will circumduct the shoulder and it it will be accompanied with clunk or click the bursitis or rotator cuff tendinitis it will relieve with arm distraction if they are distracting their arm like this so their relief of pain will be there if the patient is having thoracic outlet syndrome then it will relieve with the arm held in dependent position so it they will hold like this let's see the difference between tendinopathy tendinitis tendinosis and peritonitis in order to see the bicipital tendinitis difference or other ten, uh, tendinosis difference we need to see about this uh, uh, special terms so first is tendinopathy it is used to describe the tendon in which has become a painful means tendon become painful or injured without specifying injury they don't know about the type of injury but the tendon is injured that called tendinopathy what is tendinitis we use the itis for inflammation that means the the tendon is inflamed it is called tendinitis tendinosis so tendinosis is chronically injured tendon tissue which is largely degenerative that's called tendinosis and peritonitis so it refers to the older term peritendinitis t or tenosynovitis or tenovaginitis it describes that the inflammation to the outer section of tendon such as a peritendon or epitendon that's called peritendonitis let's see the biceps tendonitis so we are going to see about the specific age mechanism of injury sign and symptoms aggravating and the living factors registered isometry etc so remember if the patient is around 20 to 45 age so they might have biceps tendonitis so what is mechanism of injury chronic irritation or from trauma poor muscle biomechanics specially forward head posture which lead to the biceps tendino tendinitis the area of symptoms are anterior shoulder area it increased means pain increased at night active elevation result in painful arc symptoms are aggravated by overhead motion if we are going to observe this patient so they are telling that and uh, they are having pain at anterior shoulder area pain on full flexion from full extension especially the active range of motion is limited in external rotation when arm is 90 degree abducted if the patient is having a uh, passive range of motion limitation so they have passive range of motion especially the extension range of motion is painful the resisted isometric especially elbow flexion is painful for this patient and the tenderness we noticed on the biceps tendon and bicipital groove the test is used for this patient is speed test so which imaging imaging we use for this patient in bicipital tendonitis patient we use x ray for degenerative changes and the caudal view for spurring it is often associated with rotator cuff impingement now we are going to see about the rotator cuff tendinitis in rotator cuff tendinitis here we can see this the diagram supraspinatus infraspinatus teres minor and long head of biceps so in the rotator cuff tendinitis the inflammatory response of one two or all four muscles or uh, tendon or it's due to the impingement or overuse the most common source of the painful shoulder is characterized by overuse especially the it uh, because of the micro trauma to the tendon and it lead to the inflammatory response 
this inflamed condition goes to the process that could lead to the rupture of the tendon especially the subsequent thickening of the tendon and inflammation often cause the rotator cuff tendon to become trapped under the acromion that's called subacromion impingement if the patient is failure to healing process it lead to the further damage of this tissue and eventually it lead to the tendinopathy and rupture let's see the rotator cuff tendinitis if the patient is having age around 20 to 40 it's very common in this patient the mechanism of injury is microtrauma especially the chronic subacromial impingement if the progressive tendon degeneration trauma or combination of degeneration impingement and trauma so it will lead to the rotator cuff tendinitis here in this page, uh, patient we can see that the rotator cuff tendinitis results from excessive overhead serving this is excessive uh, overhead serving arm uh, here, here this is the uh, humerus bone and it is held in the 90 degree angle to the scapula means shoulder blade and here this is elevated technique to protect the shoulder and elbow if they are elevating up to 135 for their stroke it will protect your shoulder the symptoms are aggravated by specially reaching pushing pulling lifting above the head pain when lying on the affected side is more painful for this patient if the patient rubs the deltoid when describing the pain this is the symptom of rotator cuff tendinitis especially we can observe the swelling on anterior shoulder area the, this patient is having limited active range of motion in abduction and limited passive range of motion in abduction if the patient is having abduction pain in resisted isometric active range of motion pain passive range of motion pain and they are not able to lie on their affected side and they are having a problem with overhead activities remember that this is the sign of rotator cuff tendinitis especially this patient if we palpate then the tenderness and the pain below the anterior acromion let's see about the rotator cuff tear this is rotator cuff tear it is common in 30 to 50 age of the people if the patient is having partial tear it is common at 25 to 40 years if full thickness tear is there so it is common at greater than 60 ages like 65 66 ages it is very common so what is the history behind the rotator cuff tear especially patient is doing overhead repetitive activity forward head posture or they are soft baller throwing uh, they are soft ballers so they have rotator cuff tear what is mechanism of injury for this patient Fush means fall on outstretched hand so if the patient is fall on outstretched hand and mechanical compression and eccentric micro tear is there it lead to the rotator cuff tear especially the anterior and inferior capsule is tight it decrease your external rotation if posterior capsule is tight it increase superior anterior translation superior and anterior translation of your humeral head so what are the symptoms of rotator cuff tear especially the patient is having pain in postero superior shoulder area painful arc is there patient is not able to sleep at night because of night pain it is deep ache pain remember the muscle pain is deep aching crepitus is there if the painful arc is present so up to 70 to 110 degree abduction the painful arc is there if the weak abduction and external rotation is there protective shoulder hike is there so these all are signs and symptoms of rotator cuff tear in continuation of rotator cuff tear if we are elevating the arm it is aggravating your symptoms this patient chief complaint is 
difficulty with elevation of arm in abduction as well as external rotation and when patients attempt to put their hand behind their head or back that means if they are uh, combing their head or if they are taking the pocket out of their um, po if they are taking uh, their wallet out of their pocket so they are having pain especially uh, in this patient we can uh, see the scapular atrophy the range of motion active range of motion pain and weakness in painful arc means 70 to 110 degree abduction if tendinopathy is there then only they have 70 to 110 degree pain internal rotation pain if patient is having tendinopathy let's see about the passive range of motion if it is painful when impingement is present especially the rupture is there so it will be full and pain free means range of motion will be full and pain free there will not be any pain in the patient with rotator cuff tear the resisted isometric with abduction is painful we can palpate the pain uh, during palpation there is a pain below the anterolateral acromion rim special test for rotator cuff tear is for supraspinatus muscle drop arm test or empty can test for supraspinatus muscle external rotation leg test or leg sign also noticed if infraspinatus muscle is uh, tear so dropping sign is noted for teres minor muscle horn blur sign and lift off or belly press sign or belly press test is used for subscapularis muscle how we can diagnose the rotator cuff tear let's see during x-ray we can see that the upward displacement of humeral head in external rotation especially the patient is having partial tear so remember if patient is having partial tear the humerus head will displace upward in external rotation if full thickness tear is there so there will be narrow acromiohumeral internal osteophyte and there will be anterior and inferior acromial osteophyte will be there Especially, we can see this uh, full thickness tear in magnetic resonance imaging because this is very uh, helpful to diagnose this kind of tear and it is more clear in MRI. Now we are going to see about the shoulder impingement syndrome. It is also known as subacromial impingement, painful arc syndrome, supraspinatus syndrome, swimmer shoulder or thrower's shoulder so this all name we need to remember so what is shoulder impingement syndrome let's see when you raise your arm this is your arm and if you are raising to your shoulder height the space between acromion process and the rotator cuff muscle is decreased so the acromion can rub against the tendon and bursa that cause irritation and pain especially in this diagram we can see that this is acromion process of the scapula so the acromion can this is your supraspinatus muscle so here the space is narrowed for rotator cuff muscle supraspinatus is one of the rotator cuff muscle and here the tendon is impinging so it causes irritation and pain so because of irritation and pain it is inflamed let's see the stages of shoulder impingement syndrome it has three stages so let's see the first stage in first stage especially the younger uh, patients around 25 years are very common so it is very reversible lesion in these patients, we can see the tenderness over greater tuberosity of humerus and especially the tenderness over anterior ridge of acromion. The painful arc is present between 60 to 120 degree. 
if we in the stage 1 so nits impingement test is the special test used so it is positive the range of motion may restricted with subacromial inflammation in stage 2 the age is 20 to 40 years patient is very common it is not reversible by modification of activities the sign and symptoms like uh, tenderness over the greater tuberosity of humerus and along with this there is soft tissue crepitosis there catching sensation while lowering the arm like uh, during the 100 degree and especially the limitation of active and passive range of motion in stage 3 the patient is having uh, greater than 40 uh, years of the age it is very common in that patients so this is also not reversible the sign and symptoms of stage 1 and 2 like tenderness crepitus catching and limitation of active and passive range of motion and along with this they have they have limited range of motion Especially the infraspinatus atrophy is there, weak abductors, external rotators are weak and the biceps tendon involvement is very prominent. Especially the acromioclavicular joint tenderness is there in stage 3. The impingement syndrome is divided into primary or secondary impingement syndrome. So, the primary further divide into the intrinsic factor and extrinsic factors and secondary impingement syndrome it is divided into the uni unidirectional instability or multidirectional instability let's see about the primary impingement syndrome in in this slide this is the primary impingement and it is divided into the intrinsic and extrinsic factors so we are going to see about primary impingement syndrome let's see what is primary impingement syndrome the, the primary impingement syndrome it's from mechanical wear of rotator cuff against the under surface of acromion in suprahumeral space from intrinsic and extrinsic factors so first we are going to see about the intrinsic factors let's see it occurs between rotator cuff muscle tendon between humeral head and anterior third of acromion this is acromion process this is coracoid uh, coracoid process coracohumeral ligament supraspinatus muscle and this is bursa so intrinsic factors or intrinsic impingement is common in less than 35 age it is also known as outlet impingement why it is known as outlet impingement let's see it is called as outlet impingement because it occurs at the supraspinatus outlet this is the supraspinatus outlet formed by the coracoid process anterior acromion acromioclavicular joint and coracoacromial ligament that's why it is known as coracoid impingement so location of the impingement is subacromial clinically it is also known as painful arc syndrome especially the cause for this uh, repetitive strain injury like repetitive upper extremity internal rotation task and poor posture are most common cause of intrinsic impingement syndrome in the continuation of the cause if the patient is having some vascular changes in rotator cuff tendon hypertrophic or degenerative changes of acromioclavicular joint is there they have intrinsic impingement syndrome so now we are going to see about sign and symptoms of intrinsic impingement syndrome so this patient is having pain at the 80 degree of abduction and especially it disappears at 100 degree remember this is the most prominent sign of internal impingement 
if the patient is coming to you and he is telling that he is having pain in the starting at the 80 degree abduction and it disappears at the 100 degree so remember that this is the indication of internal impingement along with this they have pain during shoulder flexion internal rotation and abduction if the downward rotators of the scapula are weak forward posture and kyphotic posture are there so that that is again the indication of intrinsic impingement syndrome for this intrinsic impingement syndrome what are the special tests we did the nears impingement or hawkins kennedy test in x-ray we can see that the decreased joint space and hook acromion so if the patient is having decreased joint space and hook acromion in their x-ray so it indicates intrinsic impingement so with intrinsic impingement we can differentiate the sign and symptoms of rotator cuff tear or labral tear now we are going to see about the supraspinatus impingement so what are the causative factors of supraspinatus impingement especially the progressive loss of humeral depressor mechanism infraspinatus subscapularis teres minor and long head of biceps so the supraspinatus tendon that begins to rub underneath coracoacromial arch of the shoulder and cause increased friction due to faulty mechanics of muscle support on the shoulder so here there is a inflammation of supraspinatus tendon so what are the signs and symptoms of supraspinatus impingement let's see patient is having pain specially on affected side slipping there will be painful arc in 60 to 120 degree elevation the posterior capsule is tight so pain with passive range of motion if we are going to see the supraspinatus muscle impingement then we need to see about the weakness so there will be pain and weakness of biceps and supraspinatus muscle especially the patient is having a range of motion problem like catching in flexion in internal rotation decreased internal rotation horizontal adduction is painful and horizontal adduction is also decreased in passive range of motion they have painful due to capsular tightness patient is having referred pain to the deltoid insertion and anterior humerus area tenderness is also present for this patient now we are going to see about the extrinsic factors so it is also known as extrinsic impingement syndrome in this impingement it is a uh, second name is posterior internal impingement in this the subacromial space is normal and occur in young patients who are the throwers or full abduction and internal to external rotation throwing is there so mechanism in of injury is repetitive overhead action in this impingement the rota uh, impingement of rotator cuff against the posterior superior clinoid labrum and the humeral head during forceful elevation external to internal rotation means this throwing phase in this video we can see the throwing phase see in this video this is cocking acceleration deceleration and wind up so it may lead to the posterior labrum and the bankart's tear the most common cause is posterior capsular tightness remember if the patient is having posterior capsular tightness it can cause decreased internal rotation of your crino humeral joint and that leads to increase in 
superior translation of your humerus head so there is a poor muscles mechanics faulty scapulothoracic posture or part partial plus complete rotator cuff tear is there now we are going to see about primary impingement syndrome let's see it is also referred as intrinsic degeneration process in subacromial space structures this is subacromial space structures it occur when the superior aspect of rotator cuff is compressed and abraded by surrounding bony and soft tissues posterior capsule is tight excessive if the uh, posterior capsule is tight excessive superior translation of your humerus head is there this is most common in age of 20 40 years the sign and symptoms is limited horizontal abduction and limited internal rotation so internal rotation is less than 50 the sign it is aggravated by repetitive abduction activity flexion internal rotation of glenohumeral joint so if there is a narrowing uh, is there or if there is a degeneration process in the subacromial structure is there so it lead to your primary impingement syndrome patient feels problem at night and during sleeping position let's see about the secondary impingement so what is secondary impingement the secondary impingement is known as coracoid impingement it occurs when the lesser tuberosity of the humerus encroaches on coracoid process it is common in 35 years of the age the primary cause is cranohumeral instability or tensile overhead rotator cuff which results in poor humeral head during activities like overhead forward flexion internal rotation and abduction so if the patient is having problem with the superior glenohumeral ligament medial or inferior glenohumeral ligament it holds your humerus and if they are faulty so there will be problem with your humerus movement so patient may have history of anterior or posterior instability the sign and symptoms of secondary impingement is limited internal rotation excessive external rotation antero superior humeral head migration now we are going to see the differential diagnosis of rotator cuff tear and impingement syndrome now we are going to see about the differential diagnosis of rotator cuff tear and impingement syndrome so how we can differentiate this let's see if the patient is having rotator cuff tear so during it is common in 30 to 50 age partial tear in 25 to 40 full thickness greater than 60 but in impingement if it is internal then age is less than 35 external it is greater than 35 due to degeneration What, let's see about the history so what is the history in rotator cuff tear overhead activity and forward head posture in impingement syndrome also repetitive internal rotation and overhead stroke is common so from these two we cannot easily differentiate so let's see about the mechanism of injury in rotator cuff tear it's fall on outstretched hand capsular tightness is there here also in impingement syndrome posterior capsular tightness is there instability of glenohumeral joint and degeneration are there so if the patient is uh, saying that uh, there is a, a problem in uh, anterior instability of glenohumeral joint and posterior capsular tightness is there so it is impingement syndrome and he complains that uh, he has fall on outstretched hand and uh, they have capsular tightness and having a problem with overhead activity then we can say that this is rotator cuff tear 
but among with these three we cannot easily differentiate so for that we needs sign and symptoms so in rotator cuff tear painful arc is present especially patient is having night pain and it is deep aching pain crepitus is present painful arc is present in both but in rotator cuff it's 70 to 110 degree a weak abduction and external rotation and protective shoulder hike is there so this is our turning point and in this impingement syndrome limited internal rotation is there painful arc is there but it is 60 to 120 degree and along with that patient is having forward head posture this two complaint is common like pain in on affected side while sleeping so this is not differentiating feature but along with this internal rotation and external rotation plus painful arc we can differentiate in impingement syndrome there is weakness of supraspinatus muscle chief complaint of uh, rotator cuff tear patients is that they are telling that a difficulty in elevating the arm in abduction as well as external rotation like patient put their head uh, their hand behind their head or their head or back so in impingement syndrome they will tell that while throwing the ball over the head or reaching item on high shelves they are having pain especially the range of motion limitation weakness in 70 to 110 degree abduction if tendinopathy and internal rotation is also limited and painful the passive range of motion is painful if impingement is there if rupture is there the it is pain free and range of motion is full in impingement syndrome there is decrease internal rotation posterior capsular tightness is there that limit the passive range of motion so we can differentially diagnose there like in 70 to 110 degree abduction tendinopathy and tendinopathy is there that's why they have internal rotation pain in rotator cuff tear especially in impingement syndrome decrease internal rotation is there not pain and capsular tightness is there so how we will differentially diagnose the rotator cuff tear and impingement syndrome just remember that what is their mechanism of injury what is their chief complaint range of motion limitation and how they are performing the activities like daily activities like combing their hair or taking something uh, in from their pocket or they are playing racket ball or not like that way you can differentially diagnose now we are going to see about the bursitis so first of all we are going to see about the subacromial bursitis so subacromial bursitis is like the what is the age for the subacromial bursitis now we are going to see about the bursitis so first what is bursa as we have seen in our previous lecture the bursa is fluid like sac which decreases the friction between joint surfaces which moves in different direction so if there is inflammation means itis it's known as inflammation so this is known as bursitis subdeltoid and subacromial bursa is collectively known as subacromial bursa so now we are going to see subacromial bursitis let's see the it is very common in middle ages what is the mechanism of injury for subacromial bursitis especially macrotrauma if it is acute bursitis forward head or rounded posture is mechanism of injury if they are having chronic that means degenerative changes the area of symptoms is point of shoulder onset is gradual so what are the signs and symptoms of subacromial bursitis Let's see the pain of bursitis is usually produced with passive abduction at 
180 degrees passive internal rotation and horizontal adduction the symptoms aggravated with horizontal adduction especially pain version on the affected side line means if we are sleeping on affected side pain is worsen and if we are moving arm above your head that is also worsen your pain pain with activities such as washing hair reaching to up height of shelf cupboard for an example if you are going to keep something on your uh, overhead shelf then you are having problem so that is indicate subacromial bursitis in the continuation of subacromial bursitis we are going to see about the range of motion problem so active range of motion problem so patient is having pain and limited active elevation limited abduction internal rotation they may have full range but pain in mid range flexion and abduction in passive range of motion pain while internal rotation at 90 degree abduction it includes the positive painful arc into the abduction and forward flexion but full movement in other direction that means if they are doing forward flexion or abduction so they are having positive painful arc but other uh, motions are normal so what are the pain relieving factors for this patient if they are keeping their arm by their side so there will be minimal pain or above 90 degree there is a relief of pain is there tenderness is present when the pain is usually localized to the shoulder and lateral deltoid area but it can spread into the upper arm and pain below the anterolateral arm and acromial process so what are the tests for subacromial bursitis hawkins kennedy nears and if we are going to palpate the bursa so we need to keep upper extremity into the passive extension so we can easily palpate the subacromial bursa in order to see the diagnosis we need to see about the imaging so we cannot see with our eyes it, we need to do some ultrasound but it is always uh, not diagnostic it will take lot more uh, process and mri can confirm the diagnosis but bursitis can also be diagnosed by ultrasound so at last how we can differentially diagnose the tendinitis and bursitis remember that if we are checking the range of motion means active or passive range of motion or resisted isometrics they have their own significance and with the sign and symptoms we can differentially diagnose the tendinitis and bursitis so active range of motion means activity is done by patient own means patient is doing activity by their own so if they are having problem with the active range of motion means there is muscular involvement but if they are having problem with the passive uh, range of motion so they are going to perform by the therapist and the, they are checking because they want to see that the contractile tissue they are not used during the passive motion so if the patient is having this kind of the problem with the passive range of motion so they are going to see that uh, like there is a restriction crepitus is there or not like this way they are going to check if they are going to check the resisted isometric or manual resisted test then they are checking that the their proper function of a contractile element is there, there during movement or not so if they are having pain at the end range that means your muscle are at fault and pain in all direction means bursa is at fault so like this way with range of motion symptoms we can differentially diagnose the tendinitis and bursitis let's see how we can differentially diagnose the tendinitis and bursitis so what is tendinitis itis means inflammation so tendon inflammation the inflammation and irritation is of tendon is known as tendinitis bursitis means inflamed and filled with the fluid there is a small amount of fluid is there in bursa but it is filled with more fluid and inflamed that is known as bursitis the age of onset is 20 to 40 and it is insidious in tendinitis the bursitis is gradual and most common in middle aged person the common cause is pain during activities 
pain from repetitive strain injury they both are common in tendinitis and bursitis so from age or common cause we cannot differentially diagnose so let's see the pain features the tendon pain is sharp stabbing deep aching pain during the activity and with rest in bursitis pain in motion and at rest so from this pain uh, characteristic we can differentially diagnose the bursitis and tendinitis remember the sharp stabbing deep aching pain with activity and rest in tendinitis but in bursitis pain in motion and at rest what is the mechanism of injury of tendinitis like impingement degeneration in bursitis forward head posture or macro trauma so we cannot differentially diagnose with mechanism of injury here we can have some idea but in order to confirm diagnosis we need to see the symptoms range of motion tenderness etc so we are going to see about the symptoms let's see when the patient is having tendinitis it is aggravated by push pull or above head movement if full tear is there no pain if bursitis is there pain is reproduced with passive abduction at 180 degree and passive internal rotation especially passive horizontal adduction there is most common characteristic and sign and symptom of bursitis is swelling and redness and it is not in capsular pattern so if bursitis is there patient complains that uh, he has some swelling and redness on affected area and it is if we are performing passive range of motion then pain is reproduced at 180 abduction and internal rotation and if the patient is having tendinitis it is only aggravated by push pull or overhead movement in tendinitis no pain with passive range of motion but intermittent loss of active range of motion while in bursitis pain in active range of motion and passive range of motion side by arm decrease the pain so if they are keeping their arm inside so it will decrease their pain in tendinitis pain at the end range but in bursitis pain is present in all direction if we check the tenderness the tendinitis patient is feeling very tender to touch but in bursitis they will complain crutch or pop now we are going to see about the thoracic outlet syndrome the short form is tos so what is the mechanism of injury for tos there is a compression of costoclavicular space sclerotic triangle or coracopectoral space secondary postural imbalance osseous abnormality traumatic injury congenital factors this all are mechanism of injury if the my patient is having forward posture this is the sign and symptoms of tos but it is not a diagnostic feature so only forward head posture we cannot say that they have the tos so other sign and symptoms are patient is awake at night time and they have pain and needle sensation in their head hand the pain is poorly localized and aching pain is there pain carrying uh, during pain is during carrying heavy object the diastolic blood pressure difference is greater than 20 between both the arms let's see about the faulty posture if the patient is having forward head posture so it will narrow the thoracic outlet and increase thoracic kyphosis protracted scapula is there depressed clavicle is there and that's why they have thoracic outlet syndrome if the postural stress and fatigue is there like they are carrying the heavy suitcase briefcase or college bag purse or if they are ergonomically incorrect workstation like their computer is more height or keyboard is having more height so this all are come under postural stress and fatigue let's see the respiratory impairments respiratory impairments also lead to tos 
like ovarius scaleni and elevated upper lip ribs that lead to the tos during traumatic injuries like clavicle fracture subacromial dislocation of humeral head or repetitive strain injury lead to tos congenital problem like accessory rib or long transverse process there are three type of tos arterial venous and neurogenic so first is arterial it in arterial it involves the compression of subclavian artery as it exits the chest and travels to arm venous it involve the occlusion of subclavian vein and it as it enters to the chest cavity from shoulder neurogenic it involves the compression of one or more brachial plexus nerves running from the neck to hand so this all are three type of tos let's see the patient presentation in tos so patient is having pain paresthesia numbness weakness discoloration swelling and shallow respiration pattern what are the functional implications or what are the functional impairments in tos especially patient is having sleep disturbances difficulty in carrying the briefcase suitcase or purse patient is have problem with prolonged overhead activity inability to hold the telephone cradling or prolonged driving is painful for them they can't drive for long time let's see about the costoclavicular syndrome type of thoracic outlet syndrome what is that in that there is narrow space between clavicle and first rib that compress the nerves from neck the vein and nerve from neck are compressing because of the narrow space mechanism of injury is carrying the heavy suitcase bag or slouch posture what are the symptoms like depressed clavicle can produce the elevation of first rib and that's why the tight anterior and middle scalene also cause this let's see the special test for costoclavicular syndrome so military breast test is used for costoclavicular syndrome as uh, we have, we are palpating the radial pus and retract the shoulder into the extension and abduction with and hyper extension of your neck if the test is positive then there is a diminished radial pulse and symptoms are reproduced now we are going to see about the scalene anticus syndrome in this the compression of neurovascular bundle as a result of muscle growth or hypertrophied scalene here we can see that the nerves wires are compressed by scalene muscle and the first rib like a clamp so mechanism is compression of proximal portion of subclavian artery symptoms affected hand and inner forearm pain paresthesia along the ulnar nerve course and hand weakness numbness and clumsiness are there here we can see that the shoulder biceps tendon area is there and this is the arm so pain tingling feeling like loss of control in the head is there and this is due to the hypertrophy of scalene muscle the test for this is atson test so in this we are going to palpate the radial pulse and move the upper extremity into the abduction extension and external rotation and rotate the head towards the affected side then ask patient to take a deep breath and hold it the positive test means absent or diminished the radial pulse and symptoms are reproduced let's see the hyperabduction syndrome in tos the mechanism is prolonged shoulder hyperabduction it may occur during sleep or overhead painting here we can see that the pectoral is minor compress the vessels and nerves we can see here this is compressing the vessels and nerve the compression of neurovascular structures 
pass under the coracoid process and pectoralis minor muscle. Here, the symptoms are extremity numbness and paresthesias. So, special test is right hyperabduction test. Palpate the radius pulse and passively abduct the upper extremity up to the 180 degree and go to the external rotation. Ask patient to take a deep breath and hold it. There is diminished pulse and symptoms are reproduced. So how we can diagnose the vascular and neural TOS? So vascular TOS, the symptoms are hand or arm edema is there, cold hand, feeling heavy in the arms, discoloration due to vascular problem, upper extremity claudication is there, temperature and texture changes because vascular involvement is there. If the difference between upper extremity diastolic pressure is greater than 20 mmHg, then means it's a vascular problem. Poor tolerance of cold and activity. If the neural component is there, how we can differentiate the vascular and neural? Like if neural is there, surely muscle weakness is present. Pain with side bending of cervical spine. Pain is sharp, burning and aching. Sensory changes along the neurological distribution will be there. So like this way, we can differentially diagnose the vascular and neural. If vascular discoloration, diastolic blood pressure changes, cold problem, heavy feelings, if muscle, uh, neurological problem, muscle weakness, pain with side bending of cervical spine, sharp burning pain will be there and sensory changes. So the differential diagnosis of TOS. Let's see. TOS can differentially diagnose with the pronator teres syndrome. How? Let's see. We are going to see that the patient is having deep, boring, toothache-like pain in neck, shoulder or both. Sleep disturbances are then. Let's see the differential diagnosis of TOS. So TOS can differentially diagnose with pronator teres syndrome. If patient complains deep, boring or toothache like pain in the neck or shoulder or both the area, especially with the sleep disturbance means it's TOS. If the pain is relieved by dependent position, symptoms being insidiously after a stressful activity means after a stressful activity, symptoms begins to appear and it is insidiously appear. In the pronator teres syndrome, means the median now compares at the elbow so flexor pollicis longus flexor digitorum profundus are injured and pronator quadratus is also affected the tendon is over the pronator teres muscle we can see pain with resisted pronation of forearm weakness could be the present in abduction of the thumb as well as the impair, uh, impairment to the pincer muscle there will be sensation changes also experienced in the first three fingers of the palm means thinner eminence. So there are similarities in both the symptoms. Like uh, uh, if the patient is having neurological, they will complain the sensation problem. Here also sensation problem, but we need to see the area like in pronator terrorist, it will be like first three fingers and the palm. And here it is according to the affected now muscles patient is having sleep disturbances and deep aching boring and toothache like pain will be there here weakness is present but we need to check the which muscle weakness is present like pronator quadratus muscle is there or not like that way we can differentially diagnose the tos and pronator teres now we are going to see the scapular dyskinesia let's see if there is alteration in normal static or dynamic position and or motion of scapula during the coupled scapulohumeral movements, there means scapular dyskinesia is present. So there are four types of scapular dyskinesia. Let's see. First is inferior angle, second is medial border, third is superior border, fourth is symmetric scapulohumeral. So first. 
the infro medial border may be prominent in the inferior angle tilts posteriorly and acromion anteriorly in the second one the medial border is tilting dorsally on thorax in the third one the superior border of scapula may be elevated and scapula can also anteriorly displaced so winging in elevation of the arm fourth is symmetrical scapulohumeral so here we can see that both scapula are relatively symmetrical but the dominant arm may be slightly lower now we are going to see the lateral scapular slide test which is used to evaluate the scapular dyskinesia let's see in this test we are going to measure the distance between thoracic spine and inferior angle of the scapula so in this three positions first position is arm is adducted then second position arm at the waist posteriorly the thumb and the third position is with the arm elevated in the scapular plane, uh, plane and your hand is in empty cane means thumb pointing downward then we are going to measure the distance if the distance is uh, both the side we are going to measure the distance if distance is greater than 1.5 cm to the contralateral side in any position suggest scapulothoracic weakness or secondary scapulothoracic problem or protraction so there will be inframedial scapular angle is prominent and it leads uh, it indicates that we patient is having scapular dyskinesia now we are going to see the scapular problems so first is six scapula so what is six scapula s means scapular malposition i means infro medial scapular winging coracoid tenderness is there and scapular dyskinesia is present k means scapular dyskinesia what are the sign and symptoms in age for this let's see the age is 20 to 40 onset is insidious mechanism of injury is overhead throwing or patient is having tight short head of biceps and that decreased the shoulder flexion prominent inframedial border of scapula indicates scapular malposition inframedial scapular weakening uh, coracoid tenderness and scapular now we are going to see about the labrum tear so first what is labrum it's a fibrocartilage that attached to the rim of shoulder socket and that helps the uh, keep the ball joint in place so we are uh, if there is a tear of labrum it's known as labrum tear so there are different type of labrum tear let's see the first is slap lesion so it calls superior labrum anterior to posterior the slap tears occurs where the biceps tendon and cords the labrum the overhead movement especially the baseball pitchers develop this kind of the syndrome it's called dead arm syndrome the symptoms are painful while throwing mechanism of injury like repetitive trauma sudden deceleration injury fall on outstretched hand fall on heavy object like something kept down and if you fall then that kind of problem is uh, lead to the labrum tear especially the superior aspect is more mobile and prone to injury because it's close to the attachment of long head of biceps the main feature of complaint is catching and clicking over during overhead activities the special test used for this is O'Brien test and biceps load test. Now we are going to see about the other labrum tear that is Bankart lesion. So what is Bankart lesion? The Bankart lesion occurs in the lower part of labrum. 
it's a version of the antero inferior labrum from glenoid rim and it's required the surgery this is labrum a version of antero and inferiorly like this direction and it stretched the inferior glenohumeral ligament and posterior capsule the cause is repetitive anterior subluxation it damaged the capsule and the biceps tendon if bony bankart lesion is there there is a fracture of antero inferior glenoid rim main symptom is pain in the internal rotation and adduction plus weakness in flexion and abduction special test used for bankart lesion is clunk test the last one is hilchet's lesion so hilchet's lesion it's a compression fracture of humeral head created at the time of dislocation this is hilchet's lesion compression fracture of the humeral head it is common in the less than 50 age mechanism of injury is if the patient is falling fall uh, on outstretched hand where the arm is in abduction extension and external rotation especially the scapula orient about 30 degree anteriorly and glenohumeral joint with humerus orient anterior to the glenoid the main diagnosis uh, feature is mri especially it confirm with the mri or ct scan but mri is more accurate than the ct scan for this kind of the lesions now we are going to see about the shoulder instabilities so first is shoulder anterior instability let's see it is common in the age of 25 especially frank subluxation is common in adolescents the what is mechanism of injury in anterior instability let's see if the patient is uh, doing repetitive throwing like racket sports gymnastic or swimming it lead to the loss of static and dynamic stabilizers of glenohumeral and shoulder uh, instability will be there let's see about the symptoms of shoulder instability the patient complains that they have severe pain and feels like shoulder is out so this is main feature that if they are telling their shoulder is out so remember it is a sign of anterior instability if the patient is having severe pain that cause the patient to immobilize the involved arm especially in adducted and externally rotated position with other hand so that means it is anterior instability spasm is typically noted in Uh, sh uh, shoulder joint and uh, tight uh, posterior capsule is there so if tightness of posterior capsule means humerus will translate anteriorly and superiorly migration of humerus special test used is apprehension test in this patient we should avoid extension abduction and external rotation because this is most common for anterior instability here we can notice that patient keep their hand in abduction externally rotated position so if they are doing repetitively activity in this position their shoulder will uh, have having instability we can confirm the instability with the x ray let's see the posterior instability it occurs only in 2% dislocations the anterior instability was most common posterior instability will occur only in 2% of dislocation so let's see the mechanism of injury for that especially the seizures electric shock if they are diving into the shallow pool or they are finding the motor vehicle accidents so that kind of the patient have posterior instability there are two type of posterior instability subacromial or subdeltoid 
now we are going to see the sign and symptoms of posterior instability this patient uh, they will keep their arm in forward flex adducted position and uh, such as they are pushing uh, open some heavy or doors like if you are going to open or pushing the heavy doors in the hotel so like that way they will keep their arm patient is having severe pain limited external rotation often less than uh, 0 degree and limited elevation less than 90 degree in these patients we should avoid internal rotation horizontal adduction and flexion because they may uh, go for the posterior instability in this position and it may lead to the repetitive strain injury for them then most te uh, most useful test is used for this patient is jerk test we can confirm the diagnosis with the help of x-ray now we are going to see the inferior instability that is not more common the mechanism of injury carry, the, carry heavy objects at one side like backpack grocery or suitcase patient symptoms are like patient kept their arm in a uh, locked abducted position especially full elevation uh, we should avoid an dependent arm the test like sulcus sign is uh, used for the inferior instability test and it can uh, x-ray can diagnose uh, the, this kind of the patient now we are going to see about the adhesive capsulitis it is most common in 30 to 70 years of the patient the etiology is unknown high incidence in diabetes and old coolies fracture especially diabetic females the mechanism of injury like proliferation of the collagen in thickening of inferior capsule and loss of capsular fold especially the primary adhesive capsulitis are idiopathic in that patient has active or passive shoulder range of motion decreased or lost this patient have a capsular pattern like external rotation then which cause the individual gradually limits the use of that arm especially inflammation pain cause the muscle guarding and disuse atrophy that leads to the loss of shoulder motion and subacromial impingement so what are the functional limitation for this kind of the patient they reports that the, they have difficulty in putting on the jacket or coat if they are uh, uh, putting objects into their back pockets like if they are uh, putting their uh, wallet in the, into their back pockets so they are not able to do that activity properly or hooking the garments in back now we are going to see the secondary adhesive capsulitis so it is also idiopathic active and passive range of motion restriction is also there there are different type of secondary adhesive capsulitis let's see first in this case the pain is more noticeable than the motion restriction means active passive range of restriction is there but pain is more than the range of motion restriction this condition is self-limiting and the patient spontaneously recover within six months to a year the second one the pain which radiate below the elbow and restriction is also noticeable so pain plus restriction this patient complained the pain at rest and unable to sleep on affected side especially external rotation of glenohumeral joint usually affected then the abduction or flexion according to the capsular pattern now we are going to see the different kind of acromioclavicular sprain so in acromioclavicular sprain the age is varies but mechanism of injury is fall on outstretched hand or fall on acromion 
in this patient we can notice symptoms like abduction adduction limitation crepitation is there during palpation pain in resisted flexion and external rotation horizontal adduction can aggravate their pain especially during observation we can step uh, see the step deformity or a bump on shoulder this is main characteristic feature of acromioclavicular sprain in range of motion active and passive rom is limited in abduction and horizontal adduction during tenderness point on shoulder we can uh, see the tenderness especially the external rotation is painful in resisted isometric testing the special test is obrand test and acromioclavicular shear test now we are going to see the shoulder fractures there are two common fractures in the shoulder like proximal humerus fracture and clavicular fracture let's see the clavicular fracture we know that it's most common in childhood mechanism of injury is fall on outstretched hand fall or blow on point of shoulder the clinical presentation like patient is guarding the shoulder motions and difficulty in elevation of the arm so child will hold their hand side by side means guard at the shoulder and don't allow the elevation of the arm beyond 60 degrees especially the tenderness on palpation over the fracture site is there horizontal adduction is more painful in range of motion and diagnosis is confirmed with the x-ray the proximal humerus fracture is most common fracture in young and elderly mechanism of injury in children fall of outstretched hand and in elderly elderly patient due to the osteopenia symptoms we can notice like edema and stiffness thanks for watching and for future videos don't forget to subscribe If you have any doubts related to topics in physical therapy exams please let me know in my comment section so i can make a series of the videos on that till that time stay positive bye bye